In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. He said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Amen. Thank you for the homes. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord, everybody else. Amen. So grateful to be in the presence of the Lord and enjoying this wonderful camp meeting and how blessed we are. Amen. To be able to come into such a beautiful facility and experience the power of the Holy Ghost. Amen. By the anointed preaching of the word of the Lord. So appreciate the word from Brother Betts a while ago. I give honor to him. Give honor to all the great men of God on the platform and all that are here in the congregation. Amen. I was sat next, down next to Brother Alviar, Brother Jonathan Alviar. My goodness, I, I remember being a teenager listening. He's my hero, you know. Here I am sitting. I'm the, I'm the guy that usually preaches to the young people in the other room. And they got me talking to the big people now, you know. My goodness. Then Brother Johnny Godair comes and sits down. I thought, my, this is a dream. I had to pinch myself, you know. Here I am. Wow. Praise the Lord. I tell you, give your life to the Lord, and he will do and use you in greater ways than you could ever imagine. I promise you that, young people. And so I give honor to them. I give honor to the Holmes family. Thank you so much for everything you've done. Thank you, First Pentecostal Church, for supporting the work in the Netherlands. It's because of you and your sacrifice that we're able to have revival like we are right now there. And I appreciate it. Amen. Psalms chapter 34. Psalms chapter 34, verse 1. I want to say my wife should be listening if she's awake. It's about 4 o'clock in the morning, my time. So I'm trying to figure out if I'm more nervous or tired up here. (laughs) Amen. But she's at home, and I love her. I've got two little girls and a two-month-old son. give honor also to my father-in-law, Brother Daryl McCoy, my grandfather-in-law, Bishop McCoy. I uh, wouldn't be here if it wasn't for my father-in-law. He's uh, connected me with brother and sister uh, Holmes. And, and so I give honor to him and his kindness to me. And uh, amen. Praise the Lord. Psalms 34. Man, we've been having camp meeting, haven't we? Amen. We've been to the depths of revelation. We've ate filet mignon out of the word of God. They've delivered it. Well, it's, it's not going to be deep and revelatory tonight. Here, and it's not going to be filet mignon. We're just going to go through the drive through maybe, and get a little Happy Meal. Maybe you'll find a little toy in here somewhere and enjoy it. Psalms 34, verse 1. If you're there, would you say amen? amen? I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. You need somebody to praise the Lord with you. And let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he heard me. Aren't you glad he hears you? And delivered me from all my fears. I'm thankful there's a God that knows how to deliver today. Amen. For a few minutes, I just want to talk to you about the, on the thought, delivering praise. Delivering praise. Praise. Why don't you make contact with someone next to you if it is appropriate to bow your head? And why don't we invite the anointing of heaven to flow into this house one more time? <laughs> Heavenly Father, from the top of my head to the soles of my feet. Anoint me, O Lord, to deliver the Word of God with confidence and boldness to the best of my ability. Lord, that it would be not the Word of a man, but the divine Word of God for this moment in time. 
destined for this moment, Lord, that it would come to the hearts of every individual. Uh, and, Lord, it would change and transform me. I, I don't want to go home having heard your word in the same manner in which I came. But, Lord, let there be something in my life that changes. Set me free, Lord. Loose me, God, into a new realm of worship, into a new atmosphere of praise. In the wonderful name of Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Let's put our hands together one more time. And give the Lord praise. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Before you're seated, turn to two or three people better looking than yourself and tell them the devil's had a bad, bad weekend. Tell somebody else it's about to get worse. Some of you might have to get out of your pew. Pretty good looking people here. Amen. You can be seated in the presence of the Lord. Some time ago, I was preaching a revival meeting in a small town in Texas. And we were having, uh, we had had a great revival. We were closing out on a Sunday night. And it had been just a wonderful, wonderful time. People had received the gift of the Holy Ghost, speaking in other tongues. They'd been baptized in the name of Jesus. And so it was just like a, a celebration Sunday night. There were uh, people running the aisles. They were uh, dancing and shouting and rolling on the floor, uh, hooping, hollering. We, some were crying and hands were raised. And, and, and we were just having a, a normal apostolic Sunday night service. Everybody's looking for the supernatural, and the word's not even in the Bible. It's just normal that the lame walk, that the dumb, come on, talk, that the blind see. It's just normal that if you're, come on, if you're bound up, you can be set free in an apostolic. It's just natural. It's just the way it is. So we were just having normal church, just natural. You know, things wonderful were happening in the house. And, and uh, I was, uh, from my vantage point, sometimes it's an advantage, sometimes it's a disadvantage to sit upon the platform. Because you have to, you get to see all the wonderful people. And boy, most of the time, like tonight, it's a blast. People raising their hands and shouting. And so that night it was wonderful. I was watching, having a great time worshiping the Lord with them. When I, I watched as a, a man came in, he was probably a little younger than myself, but, but not much. And he sat down, uh, oh, probably uh, halfway back. And, and uh, just as he sat down, uh, a, a sister blew by him in the fast lane and another one started screaming and dancing in the aisle and he took his seat very quickly and grabbed the pew in front of him and his knuckles turned white with fear. His eyes became the size of wagon wheels as he just shook all over and being the lot, kind, cuddly little individual that I am, you know, us missionary tall guys were friendly. I wanted him to feel at home. So I went back to him and I shook his hand, introduced myself. I said, hey, I'm Matthew. What's your name? Blah, blah. I said, I'm glad you're here. I said, what do you think about this? Isn't this great? He said, this is weird. <laughs> Y'all are different. You know what? It fills my soul with joy. And it's godly pride that fills my heart again tonight as I remind each and every one of you that, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, brothers and sisters, we're different. I said we're different. We are different. We stand when others bow. We fight when others surrender. We buy and refuse to sell. We preach with power and passion. We separate when others integrate. When others seek the new, we ask for the old paths. Brothers and sisters, we're not another name brand of the same thing you can get down the street. We're the church of the living God and we're different. Oh, come on, somebody, aren't you glad you're part of the church of the living God? 
It is not my mission to preach like the guy does down the street. It's my mission to have church like they did in the book of Acts. Come on. We don't have to counsel with the charismatic church to figure out how to have church. We can read in the book of Acts and we can know how to have church. We're different. Let's stay different. Let's not study how they have church because then we're going to be like them. Baby, I don't want to be like them. I want to be like we are. I like it the way it is. We're having revival right now in Holland. As Brother Holmes said, we've baptized over 80 people in less than a year and and started a new church and things are going great. And... uh, it's my first time to pastor, so I'm learning a whole lot of things. And the poor people, you know, it's a feel sorry for them, pray for them. But uh, I had a, a man started coming to church, and somehow or another he got my email. And Brother Davies will tell you, I'm not real good at reading my email, I guess. But uh, I got this guy's email. I wish I'd have missed this one. Telling me about how bad the church was, you know, the sound was too loud and... We were too wild and we were too crazy and it made him uncomfortable how we did this and how we did that. He said, and at the church where I came from, it was a big old fancy church down the street. He said, that, he said, at that church, they had the decimal level at so much. And at that church, they didn't allow the, the screaming. And at that church, it was like, and, you know, it was a big, long email. Finally, I got to the end. And I was so tired and everything, I just emailed back and said, I'm not striving to be like that church. I'm striving to be like the church in the book of Acts, period. I, I'm striving to have an apostolic movement. To, and if, sir, if what, if it worked down the street, stay down the street. But if you need deliverance, you can go ahead and come in. And it might be a little louder and it might be a little wilder, but it works. We're different. So if our preaching is different and if our talk is different and if our dress is different, why should we make an excuse for our praise? I said, why should we make an excuse for our praise being different? When it comes to praise, let's not conform to a standard set by some celebrity worship leader. The Bible says that he inhabits the praises of his people. Our praise should not be an imitation, but it should be the creation of a habitation. Lord, let my praise build you a dwelling place. Lord, in my praise, you can live. In my praise, you can abide. Come on, perhaps the reason God isn't very big in your life is you haven't given him a very big house. But I dare say if you do a remodeling project and and bust out a wall and add on an addition and let God be bigger in your life than he's ever been before, you'd start seeing greater things than you've ever seen before. You ought to give God a big praise. I said you ought to give him a big praise. Praise, praise. Our history is filled with a diverse group of people, all ages and various stages of life, who understood the power of praise. From King David divesting of his royal robe on the streets of Jerusalem, playing before the Lord, to Miriam on the other side of the Red Sea with a tambourine in her hand, a healed leopard on a dusty road, Mary washing his feet with her tears to the sounds of praise that no doubt rang out on the day of Pentecost and echoed through generations, knocking on the door of today, of this generation, saying, let's have a revival of praise. You know, Brother Betts mentioned the, 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 the sawdust uh, uh, brush harbors, and, and I too was not a part of them, 
but have heard the stories of recent generations praising the Lord on sawdust floors of brush harbors and how they used to praise all night long. They would roll in the floor. They would, come on, I've heard about all of it. I have heard about how crazy it used to get. However, we have progressed in Pentecost. And I see less and less of demonstrative, crazy praise. We now are praise professionals. I said, we are now praise professionals. And radical, different praise is, is relegated to the few crazies uh, that God set free from cracking. Oh yeah, they're crazy because they, they used to be crack addicts. That's why they're bucking, snorting, and slobbering all over the place. And their ties crooked in their mouth. And you're trying to tell me that your testimony of preservation is greater than their testimony of deliverance. Well baby, I sure can't tell it by the way you praise them. If keeping you is greater than delivering. Oh, well, they'll learn one day how to bob and not lose any bobby pins. And and they'll do their little praise without messing up their tie. And they'll learn how to shout uh, without dropping a shit. Oh, come on, without sweating at all. And they'll learn how to preach with the preacher and clap even though they don't hear a word of what he's saying. They'll figure it out. You're a praise professional. You know exactly how to clap, exactly how to bounce, so you'll leave looking the same exact way. But what we need, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, is we need a revival of praise. Hallelujah. Let me tell you, I preach a lot of youth meetings. And, and, and you know, youth revival, this youth revival, this youth, they just call it youth so that... I guess since I'm so young, you know, amen, I enjoy it. Thanks for letting me preach all the youth things. I enjoy it a lot. But you know something that's kind of, uh, I've noticed, I've noticed something that we do in our churches. We place the young people and the children on the front two rows. And that's good. And then we expect them to lead us into praise. All the young people sure aren't praising anymore. I remember back when I was a young person, I used to really praise them. I don't believe, this is my turn to talk now at the big people's church. I don't believe it's the responsibility of children to leave the home. I'm not getting the young people off the hook. Trust me, I'm hard on them. But let me tell you something. When the children of Israel, come on, when the children of Israel were being led out of captivity, the Passover, you know the story of the Passover. They had to kill a lamb. They had to take the blood from the lamb. And put it on the doorpost and on the lintel. And if they failed to comply, what were the results? Death. Death to the firstborn child. As I read the text some time ago, I closed my eyes and I saw in my mind's eye, I watched a little boy with a lamb in one hand and a knife in the other. Going up to daddy, saying, daddy... We got to kill this lamb because if we don't kill him, I'm going to die. But I don't know how to kill a lamb. I see it, the same boy with a bloody brush underneath the door trying to get to the lintel saying, Daddy, I can't reach that high, but we got to do it or I'm going to die. Mama and Daddy, well, you're looking at a generation that wants to do it, but they're looking for a grandmama that'll show us how. And what you ought to do is say, son, you're not going to sit on the pew like a dead bump on the log. This is how we did it in 1965. This is how we got a breakthrough in 73. This is how your couple shot out of the mouth. How your grandpa got saved. We were running... Come on, they're not going to shake their bobby pins out of their hair unless they see you shaking it out of there. Come on, Daddy, you ought to show your boy how to run the aisle. Mama, you ought to teach the girl how to shout the glory down. You ought to teach them, Grandmama. You ought to show them, and then you can criticize them. Why don't you show your teenager how to have church, how to worship God? This is how 
we did it in the brush harbor. This is how we did it on the dirt floor. This is how you do it. Let's have a revival. Let's have a revival of praise. We can't let praise die. I said we can't let apostolic praise die. I don't want to be a part of a professional praise generation. So please, generation before me, would you show us how it's done? like you preach. I'll sing like you sing. I'll dance like you dance. I'll do what you do. Don't let it die. Oh! I know, I know we have some visitors here. And I know... Look, I'm in Amsterdam, Dutch, hear it all the time, oh, this is all just a bunch of emotionalism. This is just emotion. That's what they say. That's what what they blame us. That's just emotion. And we, we don't show emotion. I'm just going to give them one point, one zero for them. Yes, I'm emotional. You win. When I think of the goodness of Jesus. And all that he has done for me. I'm trying to hold it back. But when I think about the car that that could have hit my car on black ice, well, I can't help myself. I got to praise him. I get emotional when I think that I should have been dead. I should have been laying in a gutter high on crack. I should have been laid out. I should be divorced. But I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I don't know how you're going to praise him, but I can't sit still. Emotional. If God did not want you to be emotional, then why did He give you emotions? Praise is the result of emotion. We don't praise to attain an emotional condition. We praise out of emotion. The emotions evoked by Scripture are there for a purpose. There is nothing more emotional than the cross. And it should stir an emotion of love within us. When a quarterback scores a winning touchdown for a football team, there is an emotional response. Some stand, some clap, some run, some dance, some scream, some cry, but they respond emotionally. I ask you, did God give you the desire to respond emotionally to pour out on a quarterback star? Did he give you the desire for emotional response to pour it out on a Hollywood celebrity? Did he give you emotions so that you could bestow them upon a soap opera series? No. You were created to be emotional so that you can bear fruit of the emotion. The emotion will bear fruit. For the emotion of love bears the fruit of obedience. For this is the love of God that we keep His commandments. And the emotion of hope bears the fruit of patience. And the emotion of sorrow bears the fruit of repentance. And the emotion of fear bears the fruit of departing from evil. And the emotion of joy bears the fruit of sacrifice. And so you ought to keep your emotions on guard. The attack is on against your...
your emotions. I hear it all the time. I'm so emotionally drained. It's easy to tell when you're preaching to a worldly church because it is an emotionless church. Because all week long their emotions have been cast out on the things of the world. They've been pouring all of their emotions into the latest Hollywood celebrity gossip. Or all their emotions is caught up in a soap series. Or all their emotions is caught up in a sports game. Or all their emotions are caught up in some frivolous relationship, young people. That ain't ever going to even work out. You don't have to be calling each other baby and honey when you're only 15 years old. It ain't going to work out. Don't put all your emotions in some frivolous thing that ain't ever going to breed any results. Then they come to church and they sit on the back row and and they're so emotionally drained. You ought to guard your emotion. You ought to bottle up all your emotion so that when you come into the house of the Lord, you've got it all stored up so that He can stir sorrow in you that leads you to repentance, so that He can stir an emotion of joy that leads you to a sacrifice of praise, so that He can stir emotion of fear that will cause you to depart from evil. You ought to bottle up those emotions and say, God, I brought them. How are you going to use them? What will be the fruit of this emotion. Come on, young people. I want to know more about the morning star than I do dancing with the stars. I want to know more about the potter than I do Harry Potter. I want to know more about Jesus than I do the Jonas brother. I say my emotion you, Lord. Here I am. Why don't somebody get emotional right here? Why don't somebody just di- display your emotions uh, that you've been saving up for camp meeting? It's the last night. You might as well go home empty. You might as well go home time. I said, come on, get emotional. Show me how you used to do it, Grandpa. Show us how we used to do it, Grandma. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. Right here in the middle of the message, I feel the Holy Ghost uh, calling this generation uh, to a new dynamic and level of praise. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Remember your purpose. You were made to praise, and this people have I formed for myself that they should show forth my praise. King James Version uses it. I'm almost done the word praise 277 times. There's seven Hebrew words that are synonymous with the word praise. The first one is Yada. This is a demonstration of our love and submission to the Lord. By the raising of hands in total submission and devotion. Raising your hands to God is praise. Baruch means to bow, to be completely overwhelmed by His majesty and bow at His feet in submission and honor to the Lord. Bowing in the presence of the Lord is praise. Then there's Zamar. It's playing an instrument. Don't let anybody tell you you can't have instruments in the church house. It glorifies the Lord. Hello, this means to rave and to boast of the wonders of the Lord through excitement in dance. It's all right to dance in the church house. He was running and leaping and praising the Lord. Shabbat. It means to praise that's given to the Lord in the form of a shout. Why don't somebody Shabbat the Lord? That's praise. That's praise. That's praise. Hey. Woo. Tadal is a sacrifice of thanksgiving. This is a praise that is given even when you don't feel like praising Him. When you go home and you're no longer at Tuesday night of camp meeting in Little Rock, Arkansas, and it's Sunday morning preacher, and there's only 25 people out there, you can still praise the Lord. 
Amen. I have a lot of notes, but let me quickly get to the end. I feel the Holy Ghost. God's about to deliver somebody in a praise session. I believe God's birthing a revival and a renewed desire to praise the Lord like never before in this house. To heal, to shine, to make a show, to boast, to, to be foolish, to rave, to celebrate, to stullify, which means to cause to appear, to cause to appear. Doesn't mean you are, it just causes the appearance of foolishness. Absurd, absurdly illogical. This is crazy praise. This is praise that doesn't make sense. This is praise that will get you deliverance. Quickly turn to the 21st chapter of 1 Samuel. Someone turn there for me quickly. The 21st chapter of 1 Samuel. Here we find David who is fleeing for his life in fear of Saul. He is fear, fleeing there in fear. I'll just read it quickly. And David arose and fled that day for fear of Saul. And he went to Achish, the king of Gath. And the servants of Achish said unto him, Is not this David the king of the land? Did not they sing one to another of him in dances, saying, Saul is slain his thousands? And David his ten thousands and David laid up these words in his heart and he was sore afraid anybody ever been afraid he was a, he was scared of Achish the king of Gath and he changed his behavior before them and feigned himself mad in their hands and scrabbled on the doors of the gates and let spittle fall down upon his beard then said Achish unto his servants lo come on I need some help I need a crazy man Who's crazy? Which one of you is crazy? I need a crazy. Give me this one right here with the bow tie. He got down on the ground. Get down. You David. He's, he's, you're scared. Now you gotta be scared. You're probably a little scared looking out there, huh? Get down. You start scribbling on the ground. Start scribbling. Start pounding the ground. Start feigning yourself mad. No, you can do better than that. You gotta convince me that you're crazy. No, you're not. You, you're, come on, convince me you're crazy. Lose your mind. He's losing his mind. There he is. He said unto Achish, have I need for a, lo- a crazy man? This guy has lost his mind. What are you doing bringing me here? And then verse 1 of the second chapter says, David therefore departed thence and escaped to the cave of Abdullam. He departed and escaped. Don't stop going crazy, David. Turn to Psalms 34 for me real quick. What you got to understand is that Achish is the proper name. Proper noun of the title Abimelech. The kings of Gath were called Abimelech. Listen to this. Read the first little part. A psalm of David when he changed his behavior before Abimelech. Who drove him away and he departed. Hey, don't stop being crazy, David. I didn't tell you you could stop. He's scared. He's out. He's scared to death. He thinks his life is about to end. But this is what he wrote. What's the rest of it say? I will bless the Lord at all times. His Tehillah. His Tehillah. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in thee, Lord. The humble will hear. It takes humility to be a worshiper. We'll hear the other be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me out of all my pray- fears. Let me tell you something. The world thinks we're crazy. But really we just need to be free. I said the world thinks we're crazy. But we just want to break the strongholds in Little Rock and break the stronghold in Amsterdam. You know how we're going to have deliverance is when we rediscover the power of apostolic praise. All over this house. I would to God that right now I could have a daddy get with his son and you begin to dance in the Holy Ghost. I wish I could get a mama with a grand granddaughter. I wish I could get a mother with a child and you begin to praise the Lord like you need deliverance in your home, like you need deliverance in your city, like you need a breakthrough, like never before. You ought to praise the Lord. Come on, little rock. It's the last night. You might as well have a breakthrough right now. You might as well have a breakthrough right now. Come on. Don't be looking around to see what someone else
Ghost is going to do. Don't be waiting on a drum. Don't be waiting on a guitar. But let your praise bring you out. Oh, I feel it. I feel a spirit of victory. I hear a shout of, come on, not everybody's going to praise the same way, but everybody's going to praise. Some are going to cry. Some are going to scream. Some are going to dance. Some are going to leap. Some are going to clap their hands. Some are all you by the behind, but everybody's going to praise. For it is a revival of praise. Show me how, 1965. Show me how, 1965. 73, show me how, 81, show me how, somebody praise him. this camp meeting dancing. We're going to leave this camp meeting dancing and shouting and praising God for all the wondrous things that He has done. I'm going to go back to Holland with a breakthrough in my life because we praised Him. That's it all over the house. There's not enough room at the front up in the balcony. I want you to be praising Him. Come on. This is not an invitation. This is the creation of a habitation. This is not a show. This is a display of our love for Jesus. All over the house. In this atmosphere, cancer is bound. In this atmosphere, tumors fall off. In this kind of atmosphere, chains are broken. The spirit of internet pornography that's on you. The spirit of fear. The spirit of depression. The spirit of nicotine. Come on. You've been going behind your wife's back. Look at all kinds of trash. But let me tell you something. God can deliver you right now. In the name of Jesus. Somebody shout with Brother Kenya right here for revival in Africa. Somebody shout for revival in South America. Somebody ought to praise him for revival in Europe. Somebody, this is a converging of the church that is going to emerge victoriously. Overcome it.
were opened and another book was opened which is the book of life and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works 
and the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. When they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, each of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. 